Okay, we are live. Hello everyone. Welcome to this uh, fifth episode of the European Photo Show. I'm Michael Meraz. I'm from France. I'm a amateur photographer, uh, mostly cityscapes and landscapes. I will be co-hosting this show with uh, Hugo Che. Hello Hugo, how are you? Hi, Hi Michael, how are you? I'm good. Good. How's the weather there? Oh, I mean, you finally... Yeah, it's quite hot actually. Like oh, summer is right. Cleaning. Now it's too hot. <laughs> <laughs> and today we have two guests. So maybe we'll get a third one if Thorn Burton can uh, join us. But for now, we have first uh, Malmo Del Perro. Hello, Malmo. Hello. Hi, everybody. How are you? I'm very fine. Thank Good. you very much for the invitation. Thanks. You're welcome. And then we have Frank Doroff. Hello, Frank. Hello. How are you tonight? I'm fine. <laughs> so it's going great here. Great. So we're going to talk about uh, photographing people. I think we have two styles of photography with us tonight. Um, Mamo, do you want to start? Maybe talk about a bit you, about yourself. Uh, what kind of photography you like to do? What are your favorite genres and uh, stuff like that? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, um, obviously I'm not a photographer. <laughs> I'm, I'm something different. I'm, I'm not very, um, I don't like very much uh, tags and categories, but uh, as a matter of fact, I'm a biologist and I teach uh, various kinds of genetics uh, at the university. I have a uh, physical anthropology background and I do human population genetics and, uh, and primate evolution. But uh, I'm also a traveler and, um, and I'm also a passionate photographer. Uh, that's in a long time. And actually photography um, became the melting point uh, between the, my uh, anthropological background and my nomadic attitude. So, if you want a definition, I like to think of myself as an anthropographer because that's what I do both with the camera and with the DNA in the, in the lab. I try to describe uh, human diversity from genes point of view or from cultural and traditional kind of stuff. That's the photography part, let's say. So, yeah. So what kind of photography exactly do you do? What are your favorite subjects? So, um, as I said, um, the, the, the human landscape is uh, what I'm after. And that's um, as an anthropologist, as a traveler, and a, and a photographer too. So, uh, what interests me are uh, people and cultures, and um, as well as the environment where people and culture exist, because there is a very strict relationship. So, my major interest is in it's it's also a kind of path of uh, personal discoveries, and. Um, it's, um, it's been connecting these different sides of my personality. And, uh, and I must say that the camera played a major role in learning me to see, understand, and the respect as well. Um, those different realities that I encountered while, while traveling, that were flowing in front of my, of my face. So I must say that uh, I don't take uh, I don't take pictures to um, fulfill uh, any artistic uh, impulse, but uh, for me are uh, they are a way to to keep visual memories of what I've seen, what I experienced, or the various kind of uh, personal experiences that um, that I um, that I lived feelings, emotions. So these are my shots, are personal records of, um, of sort of privilege to being there, meeting those people I traveled, 
mainly in Asia and Africa, but mostly in Asia, and um, in very remote areas of Asia, mainly India and uh, China and Tibet, and um, so very distant and very diverse uh, realities. Uh, what I'm what I learned from my biological background, diversity, it's, um, it's something very important. It's something extremely significant uh, in evolutionary terms and um, I think also in human terms. And so the camera became a, a, a sort of um, an answer of the consciousness of being of being there, um, uh, a tool to amplify connection with realities, people, the people that I encountered. So this is more or less what um, I try to capture with uh, with the lens. I try to capture the raw humanity in a dignified way. I hope I try my best. I try to capture. Um, cultures, religions, beliefs, especially in Asia, in Asian cultures, these, uh, these aspects are very um, ubiquitous. They are there all the time. And so it's very difficult to, and it doesn't make any sense either, to separate the various aspects uh, of, them, of the culture. And uh, for various reasons, uh, I like to um, deal with people uh, dwelling with uh, harsh environments, uh, nomads. Uh, nomads are uh, my, let's say, long-term projects. I have different projects on the, on the nomad um, lifestyle, uh, both in, uh, in India and in, the, in, in Tibet. And um, and both in India and Tibet, uh, it happened to me to to have uh, to have to do and deal with uh, with uh, population that are in difficult situation, situation uh, of war. As it's not really a war, but in a certain sense, it is. In, in Kashmir, I've been going to Kashmir for several years. I have um, a sort of uh, family connection there. I have a house in Srinagar. So um, that was the base for several trips around the area, and uh, and uh, even if it's not that obvious, that's a, a very difficult uh, place to live at the moment. Uh, actually, been since the last uh, almost twenty years, fifteen years, and everybody knows the situation in Tibet. So. Um, the, the deep oppression that this population lived um, have a um, clear sign on 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 the on the people there. So, yeah, I would like to ask a question. Yes. Uh, what, what is the main outlet of your work? Who do you shoot for? Do you are you in? <laughs> do you work with uh, NGOs? Do you, do you shoot for yourself for your portfolio? So, <laughs> listen, I've been, uh, um, it might sound very naive, all of this, but um, I've been shooting for myself. I've been shooting for myself, as I say, that these are, are very personal memories. I had um, difficulties in sharing these pictures, uh, apart from the very strict friends. Uh, and uh, my, my online presence as uh, the absence of a website in my thing down there um, as a witness of, uh, it's, it's very limited. I started sharing on Google, on Google Plus um, since one year. And that's, uh, that's it. <laughs> so I've been photographing for, for myself. It's, um, there are no... At the moment, at least, it didn't happen. Uh, I made a few exhibitions that gave me the opportunity of uh, talking about some issues, especially about uh, the Tibetan situation. And so, yeah, that's what um, motivated me. It's yeah. very personal yeah. reasons. Yeah, I think uh, I, I can understand maybe not, not wanting to commercially exploit 
some of those images, maybe that's that's why I was referring to NGOs. And I think those some of your images are very powerful and could really be useful for nonprofits that are working uh, in third world countries and so on. I don't, just just uh, this one. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I'm very, very bad at marketing myself and promoting myself, uh, and so um, <laughs> it, did, it didn't happen. I didn't look for anybody, and um, I wasn't found by anybody except uh, rare occasions of friends and stuff like that. So. No, there is no, no commercial value at the moment in my stuff. And um, I, I also think I want to exclude that there's going to be a commercial uh, aspect in the future because um, not the not the stuff that I shot uh, that I shot until now at least because mm -hmm. that's my stuff. You, know? uh, you also shoot music, I think, right? I also shoot music, yes, because. Um, Actually, I didn't make a selection of the music stuff uh, for tonight, but anyway. <laughs> because um, in the last uh, few years, uh, traveling for, for various uh, um, work and family um, reasons, uh, it didn't happen as often as it was before. So I have to switch into something, into something different. And uh, since I was a musician, I, mean, I, I played a long time ago. And um, I have a passion for, for jazz music. And um, so since the last few years, I started shooting especially, especially jazz concerts, uh, which is something completely different uh, because I, I shoot people playing live on, on stage. So there is. Uh, no interaction, which uh, is actually the, the most important thing uh, that uh, I hope uh, you can see in my travel shots, where I actually devote a lot of time to, to, to sit down, talk, uh, which is not always very easy because most of the time I encounter people that uh, didn't speak uh, a common language. Uh, so. And the way I, I used to travel, uh, I always traveled. It's a, it's a very basic, so I didn't have fixers or or interpreter. Um, in some cases, I, I traveled with uh, with uh, people, friends, personal friends that also spoke the language that helped to improve the communication. Was shooting musicians on on stage is something completely completely different. Uh, there is not that side of connection with the subject, but um, but yeah, I like um, I like trying to embed uh, the music experience into 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 those kind of shots as well. Yeah. Okay, so not to to let uh, Frank wait too much. Yeah. Uh, maybe <laughs> we can ask you a few questions, Frank. Frank? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'm here. So uh, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> can you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, maybe I don't know how long you've been a photographer. Uh, what kind of photography you do? Um, well, background very, stuff. Okay, actually very simple. I grew up in a family that uh, had a lot of photography backgrounds. Uh, we did our own developing. Uh, my parents and my grandparents had their own dark room, including uh, color. And I was actually brought up with the, the notion that the still image is actually a frozen moment in time and that it's very important. Now, my parents and grandparents only actually did um, hobby photography, so they weren't any pros. And I knew that you couldn't earn any money in photography, so we started a computer business and later on added home theater. It went very well and I kept photographing and doing video. And then one day we shot a very famous piano player in the Netherlands and somehow everything took off. And my passion is pure with, yeah, with, with teaching. So very soon people started asking, do you do any workshops? And I said, no, 
and they kept asking and I said you know what I will do one and it sold out like in 10 or 20 minutes so we did the second one and the third one and then I stopped because I wanted to have a whole program and I decided to write uh, what's now being called the advanced workshop and workshop studio technique one and after that everything grew and I believe in 2010 Scott Kelby asked me to join Kelby training and that's of course a huge honor and well it's been going strong ever since we always say it's like a roller coaster ride I'm waiting to wake up but I hope we won't wake up from this roller coaster ride because it's awesome okay good um, so what kind of subjects do you like to photograph uh... actually everything that moves so no buildings and um, especially people I love people because they're characters and every people every person is beautiful and the power of a good photographer is getting out that beautiful character of somebody if it's an artist or a musician or a family it doesn't matter everybody can be beautiful in front of a camera if you know how to shoot them and I love working with characters but I also love street photography people on the streets um, uh, markets, uh, you, you can do the most awesome stuff if you put on, I always say if you put on your photography eyes and that's what a lot of people miss, they don't look with photography eyes, they just walk around and oh yeah I have to take a picture, with me it's a little bit weird, I always think in pictures okay. So you think in terms of framing and sizing moment? No, I, I don't care that all? Yeah, I don't care that much about the framing. I think framing is very important composition, of course, but I think more of stories. If if you look at my work, it's I, I try to tell stories. I try to play with my light. I try to play with composition, of course, because again, technique is important. But I think the storytelling is something that a lot of people forget. You see so many beautiful images, a beautiful girl in front of a beautiful building, and then you look at the image and you go like, yeah it's not really there you know it's not wow and I we now have a whole new uh, concept we're gonna do that at Photoshop world and it's called from okay to wow going from a standard image to the wow image and especially with street photography it's often the change between um, Jay myself once told me find the stage and the players will come just sit down somewhere and find your angle and something interesting will come don't hunt for it and it's the same with fashion photography you have to find that little story, that little turn of the head of a model that will make something interesting. So, do you interact with your models? It's uh, it's difficult to deal with a model to interact with them, especially maybe if they are celebrities and getting that extra expression out of them. No, it. it or do you have techniques? Yeah, I, I was brought up with a very simple rule. We all live, we all die, and we all have to go to the restroom. And some people are lucky, some people aren't. And if you're a musician or you're an artist, you're a little bit more lucky than somebody who wants to be. As soon as somebody says to me, I only want blue M&Ms if I come to your studio, I always point them towards the supermarket. There you can buy blue M&Ms. And do realize that if those people ask you to shoot them, they want you. So you're the artist yourself and as soon as somebody gets, uh, we call it in the Netherlands, uh, high in his head, in other words like I'm everything, it's time to put him on the floor and say you know what, you want me to shoot your images, get your own blue M&Ms and overall it's, we never had any problems with celebrities, they're often the management, that's the problem because the management has really weird uh, stuff like we want uh, water of this kind and I always say well then we don't do the shoot and then the artist contacts us and it's like you know what we just come and we have fun and with the artist there's never a problem it's often the management do you travel a lot to photograph fashion and uh, such things yes actually we're uh, traveling tomorrow to Oostenrijk Austria to do workshops there okay nice <laughs> is that, is that uh, attitude towards photography and the photographer as an artist. Do you, do you think that's different between the U Europe and the US? I don't know. I, I think it's personal, you know. Um, I, I work with a lot of photographers and when I joined Kelby, I, I was sitting there in a room and I saw Joe McNally walking in, I saw Scott Kelby walking in and I was going like, yeah. So I was sitting very, very quiet in the corner and somebody really had to pull me in like, come on, 
you're one of us, let's interact. And so I, I'm guilty of it myself, but as soon as I'm behind the camera, somehow I'm, I want to be in control, but I also want my subject to be, to be thinking he's in control or she is in control. Uh, and that makes the mood very, very easy. But as soon as I'm away behind the camera, I can be incredibly shy. Mm -hmm. So how was the experience with Kelby training? Uh, awesome. I think they're the best people in the world. They're really down to earth. It's like a family. So, and I can really say that uh, we have an abroad family at the moment, and that's the whole team at Kelby Training. They're just absolutely awesome. Did you do many classes uh, for uh, Kelby Training? <laughs> yeah, we have, I believe, seven online now, and Photoshop World will be my sixth or seventh in a row that we're going now in uh, Las Vegas. So, what kind of uh, classes do you offer on that uh, on Kelby Training? On Kelby Training, we have uh, two classes on studio technique, uh, one on um, uh, Lightroom and Photoshop, one on uh, freezing motion, a few on location stuff, and recently we added the art of dance in which we freeze motion with water, uh, flower, and smoke. Nice. Very nice. Cool. Yes. Um, so, um, when you started, or if you have uh, some people that are getting started, can you do you have some tips to share about uh, starting in the fashion photography, or maybe finding models and stuff like that? Yeah, actually, I do. Now, when you look here, you see all this for some people junk, like we have the Louis Vuitton and we have a uh, size. Let me see because I'm getting everything in the dark. We have a size netter here, like a folding camera and a Polaroid. Now, a lot of people email me, and I recently, actually today, I wrote a blog post about it on my blog, about I want to be a pro. And a lot of people ask me, and they say, Frank, I want to be a pro. I've been practicing for a year now, but it doesn't work. I'm still not shooting for folk. So I'm mailing them back, and I say, you know, add another three, four, five, six. And they email me back and they say, weeks, months? I say, no, years. And they go like, yeah, but we can't wait that long. Now, the problem is with digital. We shoot and we immediately think we have something that's beautiful. Now, all these old cameras that are here are actually cameras that I still shoot with. They are not props. We actually, uh, this afternoon we tried and it worked. We connected an Allengrom strobe to a 1949 camera and it fires. So that's going to be awesome. In Austria, I'm going to bring that camera with me. It shoots six by nine negatives, and we're going to shoot with a 1949 Zeiss Netter. We're going to shoot fashion. And there's no focus in it. It's all zone focus. It's, uh, you have to cock the shutter. There's no battery in there. You have to wind the, the roll itself. It's amazing. Now, the tip for me is very simple. If you want to make it in photography, work, 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 and be be very, very uh, aggressive in what you do for yourself. Don't be aggressive to your customers, but there's no 9 to 5 mentality. And the old cameras, now why are they here? If you want to really progress in photography, start using film. It's very, very cheap. You can buy a camera for 15 euros online. Start shooting film. Do your own developing because then you see what's going on. You see the the beautiful image quality, you see the beautiful colors, and try to recreate those in Photoshop. The fun part is I only have eight images in the size. After eight images, it's done. So I have to really think about my shoot. There's no autofocus, there's no, there's no nothing. You have to zone focus, you have to meter the distance between your model. This will learn you how aperture works, how distance to your model works. And then when you go back to digital, it's like you will slow down automatically and you will go like, Okay, because now I have, don't have to think about my image. Can I just shoot? No, think about composition. The funny part is everybody I give this tip, especially with Polaroid cameras, they are thinking about composition because every time they press, it costs them a lot of money <laughs> or a lot of time because they have to develop them themselves. And the fun part is they always tell me when I shoot digital, from the 100 images, I only like two or three. When I shoot analog, from the 100 images, I like 99. Is that the analog beauty? I said, no, it's not the analog beauty. It's because as soon as you look through a viewfinder from an analog camera and you don't have out of focus, you already slow down. So you start thinking about the story. You start thinking about composition because every time you press, 
it's not, oh, we have 1,800 more images. No, there's one less. And now with film, actually some film, I know that I'm shooting history because every time I press the shutter, that's one image less that will be ever in the world from that film because the film isn't made anymore. And that gives you even more the feeling of wow. And of course, I'm a big digital shooter. I shoot medium format digital, but analog, man, just try it. It's very, very cheap, and you will be a better photographer for it. So that will be my tip. Nice, very nice. So, okay, you've got uh, dig uh, an analog camera, and uh, you want to shoot fashion or portrait photography. How do you find a model? Uh, that can be everybody. It can be your wife, your friend, your your brother, your sister, everybody can be in front of the camera, but first learn your lights. And your lights you can learn by using natural light. Go out in the sun. The sun is the most beautiful light source in the world. And don't believe people that say you can't shoot between, let's say, 10 and 6. They only want to shoot in the golden hours. That's great for landscapes, but in, in the studio we use very harsh light. We use reflectors with grids. Well, the sun that's a beautiful reflector with grid, only it spreads out a lot because it spreads out like a whole time zone. And just use it, let your model look into the sun and you will get beautiful, beautiful light. But it's very harsh and if you control that, the studio will be very easy. Okay, so do you prefer to shoot uh, outside or indoors? Everywhere where the story is, I love to shoot. If it's with one strobe or with two or with no strobes at all. As long as I can tell the story, I'm totally in love with photography. It's my passion. Okay, nice. Um, let's go back a bit to Malmo, maybe. That would be a, a nice change. So, I can, I can, I can um, continue the, the film story <laughs> if you want. Go ahead. <laughs> Because um, the, the the selection that I prepared for for tonight, it's it's all uh, shots done on film. I was probably the last one to switch to digital for uh, maybe some stupid reasons as well. But um, I really really love the, the the film feel, the film texture, the film. Uh, the smell of the dark room and um, a little bit less the harm of those chemicals. But uh, I think I, I'm absolutely with Frank. That's that's a, a kind of experience that uh, every photographer should uh, should have. Well, I started smell. taking for sorry. The smell is not really the experience. I love. Ah. <laughs> it's part of the game. Yeah. True. I like the smell as well. The smell of the fixer, I like it. And um, yeah, when I when I started taking shots, uh, we're talking about like something twenty five years ago. And uh, for for people with uh, limited finances, as I was, and I'm still in a way, um, black and white uh, was the way to go. Black and white was an easy option to to have the whole experience. Uh, the film didn't cost too much, but uh, um, you can develop and and have follow your process from from the shooting to the to the print with with uh, with the kind of speed that has nothing to do with. Uh, with digital, of course, in digital everything just goes so bloody fast. And for me to to realize if I screwed up something uh, when I was in, in India, maybe two months before, it took another extra two months uh, to see if I had the shots uh, or the shot or not. Uh, so it's a, it's a completely different uh, different process. And actually, yes, it's very true. When you press the button you do it consciously. You're not just bursting spray and pray stuff, and, uh, but you, you are doing something because you think that that's the real moment. Then you screw it as well, but anyway, it's, it's something that is more thoughtful. And um, yeah, film, um, it's, it's a great experience. And, and I found myself still, in a way, shooting that way because I don't, um, 
And sometimes at the concerts, for instance, I, I hear people with machine guns in my ears, the, the, the other photographers. It's uh, thousands and thousands of shots uh, for the first three songs, which are normally the ones that uh, we are allowed to take shots. And, um, and I, I don't understand what they're doing, actually, because, uh, because I learned to, to be more conscious and, and I take the shots when I think it has to be taken. So I um, totally agree with uh, Frank's suggestions. Okay, good. Uh, do you want maybe to show us a few images? Yeah. That could be a nice uh, yeah. addition. Try the screen share. Yes. Yeah, did you get it? Mm. So um, when um, when I, when I try to make a selection for the pictures tonight, uh, I I thought of something that la last uh, last week uh, was. Um, was um, the 78th uh, Dalai's, Dalai Lama's birthday, and um, and when things like this happen, the the whole Tibetan population participates in a way. So uh, in Kham, which is the eastern part of Tibet, where this guy, where I shot this guy. Um, People gathered to, to celebrate uh, Dalai Lama's mm, birthday, and uh, the police, the local authorities, uh, opened the fire at the crowd and and shot two months. They shot in the heads two months and and injured uh, several others. So, I I thought that uh, for tonight uh, I would take this opportunity to to show uh, to show you a selection of. of Tibetan shots, shots I've taken in uh, in Tibet, uh, um, because Tibet it became sort of uh, popular. Lots of people knows what's going on there, but uh, I don't think that's enough. So every opportunity I have to talk about what's um, well, not not exactly what's going on there, because um, I'm not doing for the journalism, but. Uh, <laughs> side opportunity to to talk um, about those people it's very welcome so um, yeah these are as I told you these are shots I took on film I think this could be a pan -F 50 ISO and um, uh, not far from from that um, from the place that I mentioned a minute ago uh, I took this shot. Uh, it's uh, it's an eastern part of Tibet. It's uh, it's Kham, which is um, is actually China. It's a Sichuan, but uh, the, but the population is uh, is Tibetan, and these are the the the, the warriors of Tibet. Uh, they are the guys that um, helped uh, the the Dalai Lama almost 60 years ago. No, yeah, something like that. Um, in '58 to, to escape uh, from Tibet, they they are warriors. They are big, big guys, very proud people. And um, every year they gather in this uh, in this place for a horse festival. They have a a culture um, of horse um, horse riding and um, acrobatic uh, games and, and this kind of, this kind of stuff. And for that occasion, they they dress up in uh, in, in their traditional, very nice um, uh, outfit. And yeah, this this crowns. Sometimes shooting black and white uh, uh, loses uh, some of details. These are these um, crowns are made of. Um, Coral, which is something that doesn't exist in Tibet, of course, uh, being a marine thing. But um, since always they had this um, fascination for tur turquoise and and coral as well. So actually, these crowns are very, um, very colorful uh, as well. So this is another shot uh, I took. Um, 
um, around there. This is central Tibet, actually. And uh, I should, this is probably the last, uh, the, the only shot uh, that I showed already publicly on, on, on Google. And, uh, and it was quite popular a while ago when I, when I published it because, um, because I know, because people somehow liked it. And this was one of those personal experiences uh, I, was, uh, I was talking uh, earlier on. Uh, this, this is a, um, it's a hermit, he's a monk. Normally monks are shaved, this guy had very, very long hair. He's a Tibetan Buddhist monk, uh, which I met into his, uh, his little place uh, where, where he lives uh, since, uh, since many years. Uh, and I, I somehow gained uh, some kind of trust, uh, and, um, and we walked for, for several um, nights, evenings, uh, together along this uh, lake. It's a salted lake at uh, almost uh, 5,000 meters altitude. Uh, the water is salted. It's a, it's a piece of ocean that, is, uh, trapped, that was trapped in the, during the formation of the Himalayas. And, um, so I had beautiful moments uh, with this uh, with this guy, and uh, one evening he just leaned on this rock while the sun was setting down, and um, and I was very very grateful for him to let me take this uh, this picture. I don't I don't um, uh, I don't ask people to pose. I I just uh, take. Um, Take what I what I what I can take. What they let me allow to take, like this guy as well. This is a pilgrim. Is a boy that I met uh, during one of the uh, the most uh, important um, Buddhist uh, location in Asia, which is Mount Kailash, which is uh, um, sacred for for the Hinduist because it's the place where Shiva spends the winter, but it is also uh, the the physical incarnation of the of the Buddha on Earth, and so it's called Kang Rinpoche. And um, there is lots of tourists, uh, of tourists, of pilgrims that uh, every uh, summer do the ritual kora, which is um, uh, for us a three-day uh, path around this mountain. For them, is a twelve-hour thing, and this was taken uh, at the top of the mountain. Uh, the highest pass is almost 6,000 meters here. And, um, yeah, we were resting. We were resting before to go back um, to the base camp. And um, this guy, uh, basically with his eyes, asked me to take uh, one of his shots, uh, a shot of his. He was very interested in my, in my picture. And this is a little boy that I met uh, on the same on the same path, uh, very wild. I mean, he probably wasn't uh, so trustful. Uh, he never saw a camera, I guess. Uh, when I pointed at him, my 180, I think I had this in this case. Um, it was a, a little bit um, scared, but um, yeah, a little pilgrim. And uh, same, same thing is um, is for this little girl. This little girl, um, we met on the way to to, Ka uh, to Kailash, uh, which is a, a trip that takes about uh, fifteen days. I say ten days from from Kathmandu or from from Lhasa. Um, it's a pure barren land, and nothing, nothing except big fields uh, with uh, yaks and and boys and girls that take care of the yaks. Uh, so this is um, um, a little girl who was taking care of a herd of uh, uh, at least a couple of dozen of, of yaks with uh, with her sister. And uh, and the same as this one in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I met this beautiful girl. Uh, she was really beautiful, really cured. Uh, she she had her bri perfect brides. Uh, um, she she was really really like um like a model. But uh, I met her in, in right in the middle of nowhere, absolutely nowhere. 
and we spent a couple of uh, a couple of hours with uh, with her and the family. And at the end, uh, she let me take uh, a portrait shyly. She was quite shy, as you can see. And um, yeah, uh, this is. Um, uh, Tibet is it's 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 a very big land actually and uh, uh they have buddhism and and faith that unifies the the culture but they are very diverse in terms of um um clothes uh, and 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 habits uh, uh, somehow so in the in the northern part uh, of uh, of Tibet um Women wear this um, very strange uh, lamb hat, and um, so like this one. This is another kind uh, of uh, of, um, of hat. And then you can encounter people in the in the. Everywhere in the most uh, unexpected uh, way, very interesting people. This guy was a was a monk as well from a very particular sect of monks. Uh, he was not Tibetan; he was Mongolian, but he was living in the, in Tibet. And he was my neighbor on a ten hours trip on a on a bus on a public bus. And was uh, sitting on me, and uh, I wonder. I never met uh, monks uh, like like this. Uh, and uh, uh, luckily, when we when we stopped, I took this picture during one of the breaks um, uh, on, the, on the way to Xinying in uh, Qinghai in Amdo. Um, I met uh, another person who spoke a little bit of English and and told me. The, um, the special uh, sect these uh, these monks um, belongs to as well this guy has very long very long combed hair of course yeah okay just one last uh, yeah. and then we will switch to frank thank you okay a couple I could just just two last i want to show you okay. this uh, this uh, these two pictures which i i is part of a well, I'm sorry, like a sort of little project uh, I took on uh, uh, in, in Dege in uh, in eastern Tibet. Um, this guy is uh, carving a, a piece of uh, of wood. Um, I took this picture in one of the most ancient um, printing houses uh, of Tibet. If you if you ever saw Tibetans uh, use very special books uh, which are. Uh, actually, lose uh, papers uh, of the dimension of this uh, this uh, paper, this um, block of wood, which are manually uh, printed, and uh, and it's it is done in a very very um, manual way. Also, the preparation because guys like this one uh, take the original text, uh, which is the paper you see on top of this image, and uh, like mirror, they, they write down mirrored the the writing of the of the text. They p pass the, this uh, this sort of transcription to guys like this who carved the, um, the wood, making a sort of uh, huge uh, stamp. And this stamp then is going to be um, used uh, with. Um, it's going to be. Dyed with ink and in a in a very uh, fast way, uh, humans uh, um, print several thousands of the same page every every day, and groups of them are able to print uh, um, several dozens, several hundreds of copies of the of books, uh, and every every month every month. Uh, which are then distributed to the to the monasteries and um, and the places uh, around. Mamo. Yes. Mamo, I know why you like this. Yeah. Sorry. Because mm -hmm. be, I know why you like this. Yeah. Because you're a, you're a biologist. <laughs> this is just DNA transcription. <laughs> it's sort of. It's it's sort of. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's sort of. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Mamo. They were really beautiful You're images. Very welcome. Uh, thank you for sharing. Frank, yeah, your turn have... now. Do you have something to share with us? Do I have to? Well, yes. Okay. <laughs> well, let's see if we can uh, do something <laughs> that's maybe also interesting. Wow, what an image. That's really amazing. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I want to go a little bit quicker because I want to give some tips with some images that maybe some people think about and will go like, okay, I can never do something like this. Now, one of the things I look for in images is contrast. And when you look at this image, you see a bright red dress and you see a very simple surrounding. A lot of people think that you have to go to the most beautiful locations to shoot this. This is actually something in our studio. It's just a wall. Now the same goes for lens choices. A lot of people think that you can't shoot any fashion with, let's say, a wide-angle lens. You need long, long lenses. This was actually shot with a wide-angle lens. And the only light that's used here is actually the ring strobe that she's holding in front of her face. This was actually shot on stage during focus on imaging. So it's not something that we did in the studio. It's totally, totally random. Now talk about styling. Uh, a lot of people think that styling is very, very expensive. Well, this is all paper. Uh, we do this in a workshop called Creativity to the Max. I do this together with our stylist Nadine. And actually this was built by the students. It's just paper they put together and they glued on the model. You start playing a little bit with light and smoke and you get the most beautiful images. Now when you go to portraits, a lot of people think that the portrait should always show the eyes, right? A lot of people say, show the eyes. Well, when you look at this image, it's, it's okay. But as soon as you take away the eyes, you get something that's way more mysterious. And you go like, okay, this is cool. Now, when you talk about mysterious, you can also, of course, uh, do that to other stuff. I love shooting sports. I love shooting motion. So a while ago, I asked our local soccer team, can we please take some pictures of you guys? And they say, yeah, but, you know, it takes our time. I said, yeah, but it will be beautiful. So what we actually did is we took some pictures outside. We used strobes. And after they saw the images coming in, they were more and more enthusiastic. And as you can see, we're actually changing reality. And that's something you can do with strobes and photography. Now you go like, yeah, Frank, okay, but I can't shoot a local soccer team. I can't do all the styling. I can only do portraits. That's no problem at all, but start playing with your portrait. Uh, start adding some, like you see here, a little bit of a story, a little bit of weirdness maybe. Nice dark light. We always call this dark light. I don't know why, because it's actually light. But remember that light is our speech. And if you start talking like, my English is not 100% perfect, but in photography, your language is light. And when you look at so many portfolios and you see that the light is lacking, I always think, man, this is your language. So you should study light. And as soon as you start studying light, you see that you can actually pinpoint your light towards the attention where you want your viewer to go. In this case, the red hair and the face. Now, we also do some funky stuff. Like a while ago, we did something and actually, uh, now, I can't show you the stuff, but <laughs> I can't tell you much about it. Let's... Let's call it like this. But this is UV light and UV light in strobes. So we freeze motion and this is actually, I think, three or four shots combined together because we threw uh, light on the model. And we did something a little bit more. And again, you can see that we try to get a lot of emotion out of our models. It's all UV light. And then we started adding a little bit of styling, made the model black and added some light points. And this is something I think is very important in photography. You should add something for the viewer to look to. And again, why should you always see the, light, see the eyes? Take the eyes away and you get something more mysterious. A little bit of expression in your model. Weird angle. Again, styling. This is made out of tissues. The whole clothing she's wearing on top is all made of tissues. So it shouldn't be expensive. Now, when you look at this image, the first thing people will say, there's smoke. Well, actually, there's only one strobe, and it's behind the model, placed on full power. So it blasts around the model, and it creates a little bit of a lens flare, which mimics smoke. I can say, okay, so just place your model behind, the, or sorry, place your strobe behind the model, and you get some amazing shots. Well, not always. Find contrast. Like here, a lot of people shoot their images with the strobes on 45 degrees. 
start using the strobes from the side and you get like this because in reality we always see three-dimensionality now how do you see three-dimensionality very very simple because you have shadows shadows are the soul of a shot if you take away the shadows you actually take away the three-dimensionality so start playing with it and again the red really draws the eye same here we try to let the model pop out you can do it with a spot or you can do it very simple with day to night and just very subtle black and white also looks very nice but what you should actually look for and I don't know if you see my mouse pointer is repeating patterns place the model in the shade and see all the repeating patterns black white black white from all the chairs something that really caught my eye and I thought was really interesting Again, some reds, just lower the ambient sky a little bit by overpowering. Of course, we use a light meter for this, so we first meter the amb ambient light. And then go probably two stops above with strobes. And again, when you do that in black and white, it's very, very powerful. Colors are nice, but as soon as you do the same scene in black and white, you can see that it's very strong. And sometimes you just use natural light. A little bit of a vintage look. And this is just a container who's standing next behind our studio. And of course, expression is everything. Like you see here, if you just place the model there without any expression, well, there's nothing really interesting going on. Same here and here. And of course, we love working with strobes and colors. Now, one of the things, and this is the last image, so I won't take too much of your time, is I love to work with new techniques. And this image, when you see this image, now, guys, do you think this is Photoshop? Hmm. Yes, Chip. The selective focus? Yep, this is a uh, lens baby, 80 mil, so mm. it's like a shift, uh, sorry, a tilt lens. Mm. So what I'm actually doing is I'm, I'm playing with my field of focus. And this is something that, uh, this is an extreme example, of course, but this is something I'm working with a lot at the moment, just to experiment a little bit more with your field of focus. Just see what you can do. Uh, now I'm back on normal video, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. So that's a little bit what I wanted to show. You, you said only a few images, so I tried to put a little bit more in and also give some tips because I think a lot of people are out there and enjoying the images. Like I just saw the most amazing images. I'm so grateful to be seeing those. And I just did it a little bit different and I now feel a little bit like maybe I should have put in something that was more spectacular, but... <laughs> no, they're, they're, oh, they're great, am I right? Okay, thank you, well, anyway. They are fantastic. Thank you very much. You're, you're, uh, have a very, if I, can, if I may say so, a very unconventional style, which typically when you see people doing fashion or um, glamour, doesn't have very soft light, typically, right? Traditional poses and... You know the problem with soft light? Yeah. Soft light always works. Uh, just, point, uh, just point a big softbox towards somebody and it doesn't matter how you point it, it will always work. Now, as soon as you start using harsh light like Fresnels or uh, reflectors with grids, that's when you really start doing photography. And that's where a lot of people really freak out. They go like, oh my, I see shadows. Oh my, I don't know where to point my lights. And I think softboxes are something... I think you should first learn to shoot with hard light and then go to softboxes. Because softboxes is way too easy. It's always right. So that's why I probably use a lot of the darker uh, light sources. So the high contrast. And it's amazing. It's much better than a softbox, I think. But it's personal. Yeah. Michael, are you still there? Yes, I am. I have some troubles with my uh, camera, though. You didn't pay the electricity yeah. bill. <laughs> Today um, is technical problems day. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, it's my revenge for you for letting me stay up so early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> they told me it was 8 a.m., so I was sitting here at 7 a.m., and now it was 8 in the evening, so thank you, Michael. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure it's my fault, but anyway. <laughs> no, it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Never blame the guests, huh? I haven't blamed you. <laughs> I just said it wasn't mine. <laughs> Don't worry about it. So, 
Um, I think we're getting, getting close to the end of the show, so we usually like to share uh, a few photographers that we like from Europe. Um, maybe, Mamo, do you want to start with uh, someone to share? Yes. Okay, let me try the screen share again. Um, so, as, as I say, I, yeah, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Yes. Okay. So, um, I have a couple of guys that I want to mention very, very quickly, but uh, please do me a favor and visit uh, their, their website and uh, Google clans. Um, one of them is, is Andy Lee. Uh, Andy built a very solid reputation of uh, lands, let's say landscape photographer, but he, he is one of the most terrific um, portrait photographer uh, as well. And um, and so please uh, just dig his uh, his albums in his um, and his website as well, uh, and you will find the most amazing. Uh, portrait picture. The other one is also present on, on Google Plus, but is probably more active on other on other platforms. Is my good friend uh, Matias Krivitz is a Slovenian photographer, um, which I actually met in Tibet, uh, and and we were in a couple of those places that I show you before. We were together. Um, he's a fantastic geographic, uh, geographic photographer. He, he's been doing lots of landscape work, but uh, more recently he developed a project he called uh, Urbanistan, um, which, uh, which is about uh, the interaction of humans and their environment, the cultural environment and their natural environment. Um, so, and then last thing, if you if it happens, uh, if you happen to to go across to Slovenia, just pay a visit as this exhibition. There's a public uh, open air exhibition at the Museum of um, Ethnography, I think, in uh, in Ljubljana. It's a beautiful exhibition. There are um, about seventy large size prints of his work there. So. I strongly recommend um, going there. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm You're back with uh, another camera. Frank, do you have someone you want to share? Yeah, and uh, because we are Dutch, we always do exactly like you tell, like being here in the morning. <laughs> and I only selected <laughs> one. So I'm going to show you him, and actually he's, uh, let me see where I can find him, it's here, start screen share, and now I hope I pronounce his name correctly, it's Richard Powasinski, mm -hmm. and he will probably change it if it's not. Now, he's in a group of mine called Fashion Photographers, and it's on Google+, and he posted an image a while ago, and... Now, why are all the images the same? Ah, there we go. He actually, I found this out uh, that he visited the workshop of mine, so he must be a really cool guy. Um, he, this image, do you see this one with the dress? Oh, yes, I saw this one. Okay, he has a whole series with this look, and it's something that somehow I keep coming back to the images. I think it says everything that I just thought about. It's composition, but it's also the look. And now, one thing I really like to add, one of the reasons I still shoot analog is for the look. You have a lot of the software out there now that's called like Alien Skin Exposure, DxO Film Pack, and they all try to emulate a certain look of film. And somehow it never reminded me of film. It was something that was beautiful, it was nice, but I always thought, you know, I'm missing something. And during the workshops, I always tell people, try to differentiate yourself. There's so many photographers out there, you have to stand out. And you can, of course, just shoot your images, but why not give him a little bit of a tint? And somehow he hits the nail every time, because every image I see from him, it's like, I love the styling in the images, in color-wise, I, I, I love everything about it. And, yeah, that's why I wanted to share him, and I want to point out one little thing. If you go to communities, 
And you can see a lot of cool guys out there. And it's the fashion photographers uh, community. It's actually, I started it. And there are now so many people on there posting that, and you see the most beautiful work coming by. So that's something that, uh, yeah. And he's also on there. That's where I find the images. OK, really thank cool. you. Thank you, Frank. So Hugo, did you find a photographer for us? Not this time. I was lazy. OK. So I'll try to sh share one, if it uh, works. Uh, right now, so let me screen share. So the photographer, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the photographer is uh, David Perret, which is a French photographer. He's doing a lot of uh, portrait, but not only. So let me find, I had some images uh, before and I wanted to show. So, and what I liked about him is very different styles. And as you said, Frank, you don't need the eye on the portrait, for example. He loves to just have this kind of style and uh, different images. Uh, I really like his style. So anyway, uh, David Perry, which is a French photographer. OK. Fantastic. So. I think this is pretty much the end. Uh, thank, thank you guys very much uh, for coming here. Thank you for having me. Thank and you for inviting us. That was very interesting. A uh, lot of things to talk about. So um, thank you again. The next show will be in two weeks. Uh, so Hugo will be talking about expats, right? Well, I was hoping to be an expat myself that day, but it looks like I will have to postpone my, my trip. Oh, but anyway, we will, we will gather some Europeans that are currently living abroad in the US or Asia or other countries and see what their perspective of those countries, especially from the, from the visual point of view, is. OK, great. So again, thank you guys, and uh, see you soon uh, on Google Plus then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. I'll just.